So importance weighting is a surprisingly simple algorithm that's surprisingly hard to explain for me. And it only takes two steps. So before I go over the steps, let's first talk about what we intend to do. So what we intend to do is we're gonna take our test data set and then we're gonna try to reweigh the performance on that set so that it somehow resembles our current batch. So we're gonna weigh higher the data, the data points in our test set that look like the data points in our current batch. And we're gonna assign a lower weight to data points that look different in our current test set than our current batch. So we're gonna basically assign some kind of importance, the weight uh, to every data point. And then we're gonna use our label test set to just compute performance. And of course, the big part here is how do we assign these weights? How do we even try to quantify this change in distribution in a way that we can come up with those weights? And these are the exactly two points. We're gonna try to quantify that change in distribution. And again, here you see just one D example, but we might be dealing with thousands of dimensions. So it's not gonna be that trivial. And then another thing we're gonna do is we're gonna reweigh every point in the test set by how important it is. I know it's vague for the current batch. And then we're gonna just calculate the performance kind of as if the test set looked like the batch. So let's get started with the first part. And uh, the way we're gonna do it is so-called density ratio estimation. So what we, the kind of explanation is in the name, what we're trying to do is we're gonna to try to estimate the density ratio, the ratio of densities of the test set and the batch data for every data point in our feature space. And it's important to notice that we cannot just assume that the data points will occupy the exact same spots. So we need to have some kind of function that will be able to tell us this density ratio for any point in our uh, model input space. So we will need to train some kind of model that will approximate this uh, ratio because we won't have data in exactly every point in our data, uh, in our model input space. So how do we do it? Uh, just a small tangent before, we could alternatively just try to estimate the densities for each of the, uh, of the data sets. So the test set and our current batch, and then we could divide one by the other. But that is a bit more unstable because if we have very little density from one of the uh, one of the data sets and we divide by it, then we're gonna multiply the errors and we're gonna get very unstable predictions uh, that don't really work well in practice. So instead, we're gonna try to directly estimate this ratio. How do we do it? We start with a binary classification problem. We're gonna discard all the test set, uh, sorry, all the labels because remember for our current batch we don't have access to the labels. We're going to try to estimate the performance without having access to the labels. It's always an issue. So we discard all the labels. Then we're gonna say that if a data point comes from the test set, this is a negative class. If it comes from the current batch, it's a positive class. And then we're gonna use all the model inputs as features. And then we just train the model. So we get the uh, probability uh, that a given data point belongs to either the test set or the batch set given all our model inputs. And then we're gonna compute uh, the function from that prediction that will actually give us the density ratios. And we're gonna do it step-by-step step here. This is the part that's slightly complex. So bear with me. What we need to do to compute this weight is two elements. The first element, which is kind of easy and easy to understand, is that what we need is we're gonna basically take the probability that a given class belongs to the batch at any given point, and we're gonna divide it by the probability that any given that this specific point, given x, belongs to the tests. So we basically just divide this value by this value, which is what you see here in the visual explanation. And another thing that we need to do is we need to normalize by the number of data points in the test set and the batch, because if we don't do it, the model is very likely to say that everything belongs to the test set or it's more likely to belong to the test set. So this can be formally derived using bias theorem. It's not that hard, but here I just want to give you a, an intuition. So we're gonna also divide it by the number of data points in the test set by the number of data points in the batch. And this is the weight we get. And then we're gonna use that weight 
uh, when we just calculate performance, let's say we calculate accuracy. So every data point, we're going to do it on the test set and every data point in the test set for every data point, we're going to calculate this weight. And then we're just going to apply it as the importance of this data point and we get our metric. So we don't have to talk about probability here. We don't have to talk about calibration. It's a completely different approach. Let's see how it works. So again, I use the same data sets here for small covariate shift. We see that the model performs very well. And sometimes you get like a bullseye, basically. This is a perfect prediction. Uh, for very small changes, we get slightly higher error than CVP, but generally it's comparable. Slightly better here, slightly worse here. It's fine. And good news is that even under strong covariate shift, because we don't have this additional hidden assumption, the model is quite good at predicting what's going on and it can actually estimate even big changes in performance that happen due to big covariate shift. But there is an issue and the issue is small data and small chunk sizes. And this is something that unfortunately happens quite often with uh, models in production that you don't make that many predictions every week or every day. And here, if you see the big chunk size, everything's fine. If you look at the small chunk size, it's potentially not that obvious to see, but you see that the dark blue line, uh, which is the realized performance and the light blue line or teal, I think it's called, which is the estimated accuracy, they don't actually follow each other very well and the model is kind of doing random things. It still follows reasonably well the actual trajectory, but it's nowhere near as good as CBP, which was basically perfect here. So we solved one problem, but we introduced another. 